to our scripture reading, which is uh, from Luke chapter 5, and we'll read the first 26 verses. Luke 5, the first 26 verses. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. And it happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then, behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who blasphemes? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. So far from this reading of Scripture. Let us uh, turn for our song of preparation to number 347. We'll sing all the stanzas of 347.
congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our text this afternoon is this wonderful story of this paralyzed man who was let down through a roof into the midst of a house where Jesus was teaching and performing miracles. Now you children need to understand that uh, the roof of that house that this man was brought into was not like the roofs on your house with uh, shingles and perhaps uh, tar paper and plywood. In order to let someone down through the roof of your house, you'd, you'd have to wreck uh, the roof. You'd have to mess it up. Uh, but this roof had likely big ceramic tiles that were laid in order in order to keep the rain from penetrating, and they could uh, rather easily be removed. We don't know how big they were or how heavy they were, but uh, they removed enough tiles in order to let down this man on a, on a cot or a mat on which he lay, a paralyzed man, helpless. Certainly it took effort to do that, and it shows how determined his friends were uh, to help him or to bring him to the one who could help him in a way that no one else could. They showed their love for him by bringing him uh, to Jesus. And Jesus saw their work, and he saw their faith at work. They believed in the power of God to heal him. And they believed that this power was being shown in that man that everyone was talking about. The crowds had come to see and to hear Jesus. And no doubt many of uh, the people from the crowd came for the same reason that this paralyzed man was brought to Jesus. So that they could be healed of their diseases, whatever they were. We're also told that there were those present uh, who were critical of Jesus. Verse 17 speaks of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They're often called scribes. And you know that uh, these groups of people were kind of uh, the spiritual elite in Israel, or so they thought of themselves. Uh, the Pharisees were separated, even as the name suggests. They uh, consider themselves to be separated from the common people in holiness, in consecration to the details of God's law. In fact, they and the scribes uh, were not content with God's law itself, but they added their own rules, and they thought that they were very righteous and holy by keeping all these uh, rules that they had. And we'll actually see that they show an unbelieving attitude. They seem to have a ringside seat. They seem to have managed to get into this house and observe what was going on. But it wasn't the kind of observation of, of faith, as we'll see. But to all that were there, and to us this afternoon, certainly the wonderful story here is all about uh, the greatness and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what our theme is expresses jesus the revelation of the forgiving healing god and by that theme we must not simply think that jesus is the one who revealed god by uh, the things he said about him or the things that he did that pointed to him but more than that jesus personally reveals the forgiving and the healing God by his own actions, by his own words, as Emmanuel, as God with us, as God manifested in the flesh. And so we need to remember that we're learning about what God is like as he is manifested here in his son Jesus Christ, God incarnate. And we're going to consider that, first of all, from Jesus' wonderful words that he spoke. This wonderful declaration that he made when this man was brought before him. He said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Now maybe you're familiar with that story, but if not, I hope that you children were kind of surprised by that response. It might not be what you expected 
Because after all, they brought this paralyzed man into Jesus' presence. Why? So that he could be healed. So that he could be raised from his bed. But the first thing that Jesus said to him is your sins are forgiven you. Why did he do that? Well, you know that there are some who suggest that uh, the reason why this man was paralyzed was because of some sin. Now, we might imagine that perhaps the, the Pharisees thought that way, or the teachers of the law. On other occasions, we know they thought that way. Remember their accusation to the man who was born blind? You are altogether born in sin, and your blindness proves it, is what they were saying in effect. In fact, even the disciples, when they saw this blind man, asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, I trust that we're not guilty of that kind of mistake. But I think it's sometimes rather deeply rooted in some people's outlook and attitude. Even if they don't say it, if they look at someone who seems to have one kind of problem after the next, their children aren't healthy, they have all kinds of financial problems, all kinds of difficulties, they might muse to themselves saying, there's got to be something rotten going on here. There's got to be some problem with their life that is the explanation for all these trials that they're suffering. Kind of like Job's three friends, remember? who uh, drew that same conclusion, who made that same assumption, and they were wrong. And there's nothing in this passage to suggest that this man was paralyzed because he was a sinner, and therefore he needed to be forgiven so that he could then be healed first. There's nothing in the text to suggest that. Neither is there any reason to uh, connect this assurance that G Jesus gave him with any kind of special faith that this man had. Now we know that uh, Jesus saw their faith. That's what our text tells us. But he's referring, or it's referring to what he saw in these five people, the four who carried him, as well as the man on the bed. They had a true belief in Jesus as the one in whom God's power was revealed. But that was a common kind of faith. And there's no special reference to anything more as if to uh, lead us to think that, well, they might have had a general faith, but this man on the bed, this paralyzed man, he had a special kind of faith that Jesus could forgive him. And Jesus knew that, and that's why he forgave him. Again, there's nothing in the text to suggest that. But rather, what we need to see and what we need to hear in these wonderful words is the sheer divine graciousness of God in this simple assurance. Jesus wanted to reveal the love of God. He wanted to freely give this most divine gift to this needy man on this occasion. We don't even have to try to claim or prove somehow that this man was especially aware at this time of, of his need to be forgiven. You know, we might have that kind of impulse to, in a sense, try to make him qualified to, to hear this kind of assurance. In fact, we can, uh, we can even think of the Heidelberg Catechism in a wrong way when it uh, says that we need to know our sin and misery in order to know uh, our deliverance. It's true, isn't it, that we will not come to Christ for forgiveness without the awareness that we are sinful and that we are needy. But being aware of our sinfulness, knowing our spiritual need, is not some qualification that we meet. You see, if you look at, if you look at it that way, the, the next question or the next problem is, well, how much must we know our sin? How much must we agonize over it? How long must we despair? How many tears must we shed? What is the precise description of an appropriate kind of conviction of sin that would then qualify me to come to Christ? And you see, that would be all wrong. Think of the language of the hymn. All the fitness that he requires of us is to see our need of him. 
And so we, know, we don't need to imagine that this man was especially aware of his sinfulness. Jesus knew what this man's greatest need was. However much he was aware of it at the time, whatever he felt at the time, And it's true, isn't it, that this is the common need of all people. It's the common need that we share. And that's why this revelation of God is so wonderful for all of us. That's why it's such good news. Because it is a revelation of a forgiving God. It's a revelation for you this afternoon, if you have never yet come to Christ for salvation. You know, in Edmonton, we often have a number of visitors, and thankfully, we often have people that are from the neighborhood or attended one of the uh, programs, and they're not Christians. They don't claim to be Christians, but they come to church on occasion. And that's a wonderful thing to know that uh, we have the opportunity to uh, make Christ known to people who don't profess to believe him. I get the uh, privilege of preaching Christ to people that I know are unconverted. They're not Christians. And if there's someone like that this morning, you need to know that Jesus knows your greatest need, whether you know it or not, whether you're particularly aware of it or not. But that's the same, that's also true, isn't it? Of those who may be raised in the church and belong to the covenant and may even know a lot about God, but it's possible to know a lot about God and a lot about Jesus. And yet to be far from God and not know what it's like to truly believe and rejoice in the forgiveness of my sin in such a way as to make, such a way as to make me love this gracious Savior. But you also need to know that there is forgiveness with Christ. And He knows your greatest need. And He assures us that whoever comes to Him, He will not cast them out. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if someone who is far from God and has never known what it is to truly rejoice in the forgiveness of sins would hear this Word of God, this Word of the Savior for them? Well, I know that Christ is able to Uh, make this word of forgiveness very real to the hearts of people, even for the first time when they come to him. But whether they gain that kind of assurance now, it is certainly true that whoever calls upon the Lord Jesus Christ and whoever comes to him for forgiveness will not be turned away and will come to the knowledge of the forgiveness of sins. That's what's so wonderful about this passage as a revelation of God. A revelation that we all need for us who are believers. And yet we can grow cold and we can lose something of the wonder of the forgiveness of sins. And we can fail to be attentive to that assurance of pardon that we hear. Or when the minister greets us in the name of God and says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very easy for us to be so familiar with the words that we hardly pay attention. Oh, the minister says that every Sunday. That's why I felt bad about getting that mixed up this this afternoon, because that's an important part of the service, isn't it? God speaks to us a word of peace. God is assuring his children of the forgiveness of sin, saying, my son, my daughter, your sins are forgiven. Actually, in in the Gospel of Mark, in Mark's account, Jesus uh, uses that very language. Son, your sins are forgiven. My daughter, think of God standing over this poor man saying, my son, your sins are forgiven. Isn't that a wonderful thing? A wonderful declaration. A revelation of God. The pardoning God. And this assurance of pardon is for us. And we need to believe it and take hold of it. And not let the circumstances of our lives hinder us from receiving it and rejoicing in it. You know that can happen. We can become very downcast. We can become discouraged and depressed. And uh, we have good reason for that, right? Because of circumstances in our lives. Maybe situations in our home life. 
maybe health concerns, maybe deep concerns that we have for, for loved ones, spiritual concerns or physical concerns, or maybe we, maybe we have personal troubles that are very, very private, that are very secret, and maybe even very, very complicated so that we despair of even really being able to talk to anyone about them because they're too complicated and we hardly know how to think through them ourselves. And we might think that all these circumstances are the reason why we can't expect to be happy and to be of good cheer. And then we need to remember what Jesus said to this paralyzed man. He said to the paralyzed man, be of good cheer. I know it's not in our text, but you can look at Matthew's account. And in Matthew's account, we have that very language. Son, take heart. Be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. There he lies, paralyzed. And Jesus commanding him to be of good cheer. Because to have our sins forgiven is to have our greatest problem taken care of. To have our greatest need already addressed. We're at peace with God. We're justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that means we have eternal life. And with all the troubles, with all the circumstances that we have to deal with, those circumstances shouldn't rob us of the joy of the forgiveness of sins. It's a wonderful declaration, a wonderful revelation of God. Secondly, what we have in our text is a very important question that Jesus asks. And it's a very revealing question, as we'll see. It's there in verse 23, where Jesus asks, which is easier, to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? Now, it would be very interesting if I could hand out ballots and have you all give your answer to that question. Which is easier, to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise up and walk. There were many sitting by, as we, uh, as we already observed, who were not thrilled at all over Jesus' word of forgiveness. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law. In general, they were not the kind of people who took great pleasure in God's grace to those whom they judged to be rather unworthy of it. That's the whole point of the uh, story of the elder brother and the prodigal son. He couldn't rejoice at his younger brother's acceptance and forgiveness uh, from his father. And that's a heart problem, isn't it? That's a fundamental problem of their view of God. The only thought that God was favorable to people like themselves who somehow made themselves qualified by their own righteousness. And that's a fundamental problem about God. But it's a, it's a religious problem, too. And when people have a fundamental heart problem and they're religious, what do they do? They try to find a theological, doctrinal justification for their heart problem. And that's what the Pharisees and the scribes did. And they thought they had a good one on this case, right? Who is this man who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And you know that they were absolutely correct on the one point. And that is that God alone forgives sins. Yes, we're called to forgive the sins of those who sin against us. But only God can forgive sins committed against him. And that's what Jesus is talking about. No priest can do that. No minister can absolutely pronounce assurance on people. He can proclaim the conditions that God has revealed. But only God forgives sins. They were right. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgression. For my own name's sake, the Lord says. And your sins I will remember no more. That's a divine act. Think of Micah's declaration of, uh, of God in the seventh chapter where he says, And who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. 
He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Only God can remove our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. And so the Pharisees were right on that point, but that uh, means that there are only one of two possibilities. And the one, the first, that they ought to have recognized is the one who speaks this word of forgiveness is one with God in his authority to forgive sins. Or, of course, the other option, which they preferred, was that Jesus makes empty claims. And these empty claims are of such a serious nature that they would put Jesus in the category of a lunatic, a fanatic, one who dares to presume to identify himself with God, a sin worthy of death. That's what blasphemy was. And in their hearts, they were condemning him for blasphemy. You see their heart of unbelief. And it's a heart of unbelief which Jesus then exposes. And, and first of all, notice that he exposes it in a way that further demonstrates his divinity because he knew their thoughts. Why do you reason in your hearts? They didn't say anything. But the omniscient God knew what they were thinking. And then he exposes it by this question that we need to look more at. What is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? Well, I would hope that if I handed out papers for you to answer that question that you would either return them blank or you would uh, object to the terms of the question. Because uh, it's not a question that we can properly answer one way or the other. Now, as mere words, they are both rather easy uh, to say, or rather difficult. Perhaps some of the smallest children might find it hard to say, rise up and walk. You'd have to coach them through it one word at a time. But as mere words, uh, neither one is particularly difficult or easy to say if you're only one and a half. But these aren't mere words, are they? Does God speak mere words? Empty words? When God said, let there be light, were those mere words? No, there was light. And when, when Jesus says, throw your net into the water, were those mere words? Were they empty words? No, they were words that effected a great miracle. When Jesus says, be cleansed, were they empty words? No, this leper in his desperate condition immediately was cleansed of his leprosy. God doesn't speak mere words. You understand the point, don't you? The question really goes like this in terms of its meaning. What is easier to say with a corresponding effect? Your sins are forgiven you. Or take up your bed and walk. Or to put it another way, what is easier to do? Forgive sins? Or raise a paralyzed man by your word? You see, when you put it that way, you get the point, right? They're both impossible with man. Utterly impossible by any kind of human power. Either to forgive sins or to raise up a paralyzed man by speaking a word. These are divine acts. Right. Exactly. That's the point. And so it's a question that exposes unbelief, isn't it? Because Jesus had already been revealing God with us who healeth all your diseases. Right? 
in the previous part of this chapter, or in chapter 4, verse uh, 36 and 7, after Jesus had cast out a demon, they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word is this! For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Verse 40, When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Or after the record of the healing of the, the leper, we read that the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. I mean, after all, isn't that what brought the, the Pharisees and the scribes there in the first place? They heard about the power of this man who was healing every kind of disease. He speaks a word. He touches them, and they're completely well. And you see, brothers and sisters, that it's at these, this point that these spiritual elite, they should have studied their Bible a little bit harder. And they should have paid more attention to what God actually says. Because when God says in Isaiah chapter 35, they shall see the glory of the Lord. It's in the context of the eyes of the blind being opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped and the lame leaping like a deer and the tongue of the dumb singing. And that's what's happening in the ministry of Jesus as God is revealed in the flesh doing the works of God healing like no prophet ever healed speaking words in his own authority exercising a kind of divine direct power over every kind of disease and devils and death itself and the Pharisees had, and the scribes had seen that. They had confronted that. And if they applied the Scripture, they had ample reason to see it fulfilled in Jesus, didn't they? But instead, they criticize Him. And instead, what do they constantly do? They ask for more signs. What they've seen so far really isn't quite enough. Jesus feeds thousands of people with a few loaves of fish and uh, some bread. And uh, the next thing we read is that the Pharisees are coming to him asking, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead and they say, this man does many signs. Let's kill him. You see, the problem was not a lack of evidence. The problem was an unbelieving heart that Jesus exposes with a question that confronts them with the fact that they were in the presence of divine power, in the presence of God, in the person of Jesus, demonstrated by what he was saying and doing. Think of Peter's reaction to the sign that Jesus gave of himself. After he said, cast your net, pull it up, and there were so many fish that the boat couldn't contain it. They needed help from another boat. And Peter got the point. And he fell at his feet, saying, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. It's like an Isaiah experience, isn't it? Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the, people, in the midst of a people with unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king. Peter knew in some way that he was in the presence of God. It's a question that exposes unbelief, but it's a question that's not irrelevant for us who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It's also a question that uncovers a, a common mistake. And here, uh, I encourage you to pay attention because this point might seem a little bit more subtle than the last one. But consider the fact that the Pharisees and the scribes, they had to admit, because they were confronted with their, by their own eyes, they were confronted with the fact that there were certain powers that were demonstrated by Jesus. 
But what they failed to do was recognize who Jesus was so as to embrace him and believe in him in true faith. They failed to embrace Jesus himself. And you know that there is a subtle way in which we can do something similar to that. And that is when we separate the benefits that we would receive from Christ, from receiving Christ, himself, the whole Christ. Maybe I can illustrate it by asking another question. What is easier to get from Jesus? The forgiveness of sins? Or renewal of life? To put the same question in different ways, what is easier to get from Jesus? Justification or sanctification? And you see, that's the wrong question. That's the wrong question altogether. Because it shows a wrong way of thinking. That distinguishes certain benefits that we would hope to get from Christ, from receiving Christ, the whole Christ himself. You know that I wouldn't want to try to persuade any of you to simply receive certain benefits from Jesus. Whether it's the forgiveness of sins or help to change your life. You know, there are a lot of people that think about preaching and gospel ministry that way. This man's always trying to persuade me to take certain things and get certain benefits from Jesus. But I would not try to persuade anyone from getting anything from Jesus Christ apart from embracing and receiving Christ himself, the whole Christ, in all his fullness and grace and glory. To receive the gospel is not to get things from Christ. To receive the gospel is to be in Christ, who is our life, without whom you have nothing, and in whom you have everything. You have the forgiveness of sins. You have His Spirit dwelling in you to sanctify you, to preserve you, to keep you. You are complete in Him. See, that's the glory of the gospel of grace. It's not that Jesus offers some benefits that we can get from him. It's that Jesus offers himself in the fullness of his divine grace for us to receive with a believing heart, to stake our lives and our all upon this glorious divine Savior. To hear these words from Isaiah chapter 35 in that light where the Lord says, Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, Be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come. He will come and save you. And you know that's fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ that we might behold our God and believe in Him and receive Him as our God, the forgiving God, the healing God, in whom we have all that we need and who is all then for us. All by pure grace. And then finally, Jesus' amazing demonstration. Briefly, in verses 24 and uh, 25, we read that immediately uh, He rose up Or he said to them, no, listen to this. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed. I say to you, rise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. After all this, after the secret criticism and rejection of the revelation that Jesus had been giving to the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus says, but that you may know 
that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. That you, that you Pharisees, that you teachers of the law might know it. Know it, not in an intellectual way, that, that you might know the truth of it, the wonder of it, that the Son of Man is present with you. This glorious figure of Daniel who comes in the majesty of God, who is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Yes, He has power on earth to forgive sins. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove it to you again. And so he says to the paralyzed man, take up your bed and walk. It's almost as if this miracle isn't for you. You already have enough reason to be happy and rejoice, but I'm still going to heal you, and I'm going to do it to teach these others a lesson. That I have the power on earth to forgive sins. That they might turn to him also in their greatest need for the greatest gift that God gives, the forgiveness of sins whatever our circumstances might yet be in this life. You see, Jesus gives amazing reasons to glorify God, doesn't he? That's the response. The people were astounded. They were amazed. We have seen strange things. Now we hear that and think, we might think, well, wow, that's as if we saw weird things. Or No, we've, we've seen things that we have no category. We don't know where to put them. They are so amazing. We can't comprehend them. Yes, you've been in the presence of God. The revelation of the forgiving and the healing God. And so indeed, the proper response is to glorify Him and to praise Him and to have our hearts open to Him and to one another because of the amazing grace that He shows to sinners. Amen. In response, let us join together in prayer. Almighty God and gracious Father in heaven, what a wonderful revelation that you have given to us of yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ, whom to see is to see the Father, whom to know is to know the Father. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to Enable us to behold your glory revealed in these pages of your word, to see your wondrous grace evident in the assurance of the forgiveness of sins, an assurance that is ours in our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen and bless us with that comfort, that you would also strengthen and comfort those whose circumstances may be hard, those who may be nearing the end of this life in the frailty of old age, those who are weak in body or who suffer from physical pain or who endure circumstances in their personal life that seem to go on and on without resolution. Lord, we pray that you would sustain them with your wondrous grace and the assurance of their reconciliation to you and their assurance of ultimate healing, that indeed you heal all our diseases and we await the redemption of our bodies. Help us also, then we pray, as those who are uh, cheered up by your word, those who have every reason to take heart, to go forth into this new week serving you in our calling. May we do it with joy, we pray. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. For our song of application, let us turn to the hymn that's printed in your bulletin. It's taken from the new... Uh, song book, and we'll sing the five stanzas together.
this time our offering will be received for debt reduction. <laughs> 